everybody. Welcome to Mr. Wild's Wild Halloween uh, from Pellegrin Press. Uh, many of us have been unable to go to Halloween parties uh, this year for some reason that I just I can't think of what that is. So uh, we're here to uh, jump in. Uh, but whether you're watching this uh, on Halloween or, uh, or later, uh, we're running a game of the Yellow King role playing game designed by yours truly. Uh, this is uh, one of our gumshoe line of games of investigative mystery. Uh, like many of our games, uh, this is a horror game, and uh, this is based on the uh, classic uh, horror stories of Robert W. Chambers, uh, and it is a uh, sort of a, about a reality breakdown about a book, a play called The Cane Yellow, which is never produced, but uh, seeps through the world starting in 1895 and starts to change people's minds for the worse and possibly even change the world. And uh, the game uh, divides into four different sequences or uh, time periods or settings. Uh, the first one starts in 1895 Paris, but the one we're gonna deal with today is the one in the modern day, this is normal now, in which just plain ordinary people uh, possibly run into something uh, disturbing and try to maintain uh, their identities in the face of that disturbing thing. Um, and so we're going to start off by uh, introducing the group and setting the scene a bit. Uh, so everyone is headed to a uh, party called Mr. Wild's Wild Halloween. Uh, this is an, an observatory in an unspecified American city, and uh, there is a, a vehicle driving our main characters uh, toward uh, this exciting uh, Halloween party. This is uh, a uh, this is the first big moment everybody has had since the vaccine when it is safe to go to a party again. And so all across uh, the world, Halloween is the exciting moment of celebration where people are going to be able to cut loose and be with each other and not worry about all of that stuff. And nothing bad will possibly happen. So we have a vehicle full of people, and uh, uh, I'm going to have uh, you each uh, introduce yourself as the vehicle winds its way up a, a sort of a, 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 a road alongside kind of a cliff and there's a dense uh, forest and the headlights are uh, lighting up the trees. And uh, there's a group of you together. Uh, there's a reason why you would all go uh, to a party uh, together. And I'm gonna get you each to describe uh, your uh, character a bit and also describe uh, the costume that you're wearing, which might coincidentally uh, be the same costume that the uh, players are uh, wearing. So uh, let's go to the group. And uh, start uh, with Misha. Tell us uh, a, a bit about your character as, as the camera would uh, uh, track her uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this horror story. She is a, uh, she's playing, uh, no, no, let's try that again. I am Misha B. I am playing Angela. Angela is going to this costume party as Regina Maleficia, the Empress of Evil. Uh, she's a, uh, normally she's a shy, reserved person. Uh, she's a librarian by trade. Uh, just kind of chill, kind of just kind of soaking it all in, trying to get into persona while she's driving, while she's in this, this vehicle. Uh, she's got a flask that she's probably taken a few sips of liquid courage from. Uh, and, uh, she, she's kind of like looking around at the others, uh, wondering what's going on. Uh, and uh, next up, we have uh, Lucy, as played by Kat Tobin. Hello, um, I'm Kat Tobin, um, and I'm playing Lucy. Um, Lucy is in her everyday life an accountant, and um, so she takes any opportunity possible to like dress up um, as glam as she can do. She loves a party. She absolutely loves to get out there and loves to meet people and to hang out and chat. Um, so she's like probably sitting in the back seat because she can't drive um and she's like you know kind of really excited and, and like a child kind of you know going to a sweet shop or something she's just like yay party uh next up we have uh, james pemberton that's played by wade rocket i am wade rocket and uh i'm playing james uh james is a uh a stocky uh friendly uh laid-back kind of fellow uh he uh, works as a customer service supervisor at Circuit Guy, and uh, he um, he's uh, been taking some ribbing uh, from his friends uh, for his half-ass Halloween costume uh, because although he loves uh, being social and 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 going out with the gang, 
Uh, he's just kind of loses track of stuff and is pretty laissez-faire about these kinds of things. Uh, James called shotgun early on uh, and is, uh, and is uh, inflicting his music on everybody in the car. Um, so we've, uh, uh, by mentioning that you're writing shotgun, uh, you raised already a question that I thought I would uh, ask the group. Uh, and so uh, at the end of this, we will determine whether uh, you hired a car, uh, probably like a, an, an Uber van, or whether uh, one of you is, is driving. Uh, but we'll, uh, the next step, however, is to introduce uh, Saurav Bhattacharya, played by Sharon Bitswas. Uh, tell us about uh, your character. Here. Yeah, so uh, Saurav Bhattacharya uh, is a computational um, bioanthropologist at the local fancy university, which is different from the local not fancy university, very important. Um, and uh, he he like you know he enjoys socializing, but he's not he's never been a he's never been a sorry about that um, he's never been a um, costume person. So he when he was talking to his boyfriend, being like, oh my god, I have to get a costume, and he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother his boyfriend. Like, no, it's Halloween, you have to, and I'm like, fine. And so he hasn't been in the lab in a, in years because his PhD was in the computational side, but he dug through and found the lab coat he wore in his master's program. He like pulled out some old goggles that he used to wear as an undergrad, put on a glove, and he's like, there, I'm a mad scientist. Uh, and so it's, it's very half-assed. I mean, he did dig through his wardrobe, so he did put some effort. But um, yeah, and uh, yeah, he's like a hotshot um, um, computer engineer person, so. Uh, and next we come to uh, Sunshine Webster, uh, played by Ruth Tillman. Hey, I'm Ruth Tillman and I'm playing Sunshine Webster. And uh, Sunshine is, she was a goth as a teenager. Now she's a paralegal, and she still tries to get out that goth vibe whenever she can because it's not professional to wear lots of eyeliner in the workplace, she's been told by the slightly uptight law firms that she works for. So Sunshine loves going to goth clubs, enjoys going to bands, and tonight she is simply wearing a basic costume, which is a mask from one of her favorite bands, and she is going as a nameless ghoul. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I'd like you to uh, uh, discuss with each other for a bit and just determine how it is that you all know each other. Why would you all be going to a party together? What is the, the basis of your acquaintanceship or friendship? I, I think someone has to be um, associated with the university in some way, either works there or has a spouse or a partner who works there or went there and, or something like that. Uh, clearly, I, I am the fancy university librarian. Oh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. In fact, I'm the librarian of the anthropology department, and like that. Sure. That really, yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like I went to college with, uh, with some or all of you. Mm. I, yeah, that could I, be a thing. We could all have gone to the same college. Yeah, we could all be college. Yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, college friends that ended up in the same town. Yeah, I, I like the idea that perhaps I did my paralegal degree at Fancy University and some of the time I was sort of ducking around because sure, Angela and Sarov are both a little little more fancy than I am, but it was nice to see them anyway. You know, I spent a few years trying to get my my life together before I decided paralegal is the way to go. Uh, and so uh, at this point, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the rules by looking at everybody's character sheet. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with uh, Misha's character. And uh, the, uh, the unseen Pelgrane Zephyrs behind the scenes are uh, switching to let us see the uh, character sheet there. Uh, and so uh, the first thing you see on the character sheet after the character's name and after the player's name is a drive. Uh, this is a horror game, and what we what you occasionally need in a horror game, especially for people who are not necessarily quite ready to embrace the premise, which happens more often than you would think, uh, having read a lot of playtest feedback, uh, is a reason why the character uh, goes into uh, uh, danger, why they act like an exciting adventure character, or in this case, like a horror movie character, instead of doing the sensible person thing, 
when trouble arises and heading in the opposite direction. So why do you head uh, toward trouble? And here in this case, uh, the drive is, has to be in charge. Uh, now, Misha, earlier you suggested that you were kind of uh, a shy person, but also you suggested that you're kind of, that you're a librarian. Uh, so how does that? Uh, how do you think having to be in charge uh, will uh, affect the way that you uh, play your character? Uh, so, so there's a difference between being loud and being boisterous and being uh, uh, commanding. And uh, no, I'm in charge here, and you're going to do what I say. And if you don't do what I say, bad things will happen to you. <laughs> And so you, you've got that kind of like mom librarian voice thing going on where it's, no, I don't have to raise my voice to make you do what I want. You're going to do what I want. I know what kind of librarian you are. I think I've met librarians like you. <laughs> uh, so You're next we have, sweet. yes, very sweet and in control. Uh, so next we have the investigative abilities. These are the, the core of gumshoe. Gumshoe is about uh, solving mysteries and uh, uh, the investigative abilities are the ways that you gather information in, which enables you to move uh, through the storyline toward the horrible confrontation at the end. Uh, a big difference uh, between uh, investigative skills in uh, Gumshoe and in some other games that you might be familiar with is you never have to roll to determine whether you get uh, information or not because it's never interesting to fail to get information. Uh, and you may be familiar with the syndrome where you uh, need to, to find a particular book in the library that tells you to go to the old mill. And if you've ever been a game where you have to roll to see if you find the book and seeing your character uh, or the GM have to struggle to then uh, find out what to do if you fail, well, this game just doesn't do that. It just, it's always interesting to get information. It's never interesting to fail. So all you have to do is what you do in any uh, traditional role-playing game where you have a skill that gathers information, which is you describe uh, what it is that you're doing to get the information and the gym gives you the information. All you do is you skip the role, you always succeed. Uh, and in uh, this version of Gumshoe, uh, everybody gets two pushes that they can use in the course of the session. And those pushes uh, are a resource that you can use to get an extra non-informational benefit out of your investigative ability. Uh, so if we, for example, we see uh, the uh, abilities that Angela has are related uh, to uh, her job as a librarian in various ways. So she uh, knows a lot about architecture. She has a broad uh, knowledge of the humanities. Uh, she also uh, has an interpersonal ability. This is a way that she gets information out of other people. And in this case, she has inspiration. And that's the ability to make people believe in themselves and to make them uh, believe that they can be the best version of themselves and therefore want to cooperate uh, with Angela and uh, give her the information that they need. Uh, she also has photography and technology, which is a broad ability to deal with uh, devices and, and, and items of technology and so forth. Um, and so, for example, if you're using inspiration to uh, convince one of the characters that you meet along the way uh, to, to tell you something, that doesn't cost you anything, doesn't require a role. But if you, for example, want to inspire someone to do something above and beyond that, something uh, useful, like guard your car for you while you go off and do something, you might, uh, you would then spend a push in order to turn that investigative ability, that inspiration in this case, into an actual action. Uh, you will notice then that there are general abilities that all the characters have. These are the abilities that cover situations where it's interesting to fail to get information, uh, or sorry, where it's interesting to fail, I should say. Uh, and so uh, when you are uh, climbing a fence to get away from the security dogs, it is just as interesting to fail and get bitten. It's worse, but it's still interesting as it is to succeed. So when you're using any of these abilities to achieve uh, something physical or doubtful in the world, you uh, determine ahead of time how many points from your ability pool. And uh, for example, uh, Misha's character has uh, eight points in athletics, uh, which tells us that she's a very athletic fit person, probably does a lot of sports, possibly works out. Uh, and so uh, you are rolling a D6 and uh, you're often trying to beat a difficulty number of four. Sometimes the difficulty number is higher. And you specify ahead of the roll how many points you want to spend uh, from your general ability pool in order to add to the die roll. So you know, for example, if you're spending two points, that you're pretty well guaranteed of succeeding 
at any kind of normally heroic uh, style task. And so this gives you the ability to uh, determine uh, kind of sort of mostly, depending on how hard things are, how well you're going to uh, succeed uh, over the course of the uh, adventure. Uh, now, there are some other rules that we may or may not run to, into, depending on where the story goes, and I'll describe those uh, as we go. But in the meantime, uh, let's uh, quickly look at Sunshine Webster's uh, character sheet. Uh, so, uh, Ruth, uh, you have the drive. If I don't fix this, no one will. And I, before we got on camera, I think, I think you were saying I, you felt somewhat attacked by this drive. I did feel personally attacked in that I, I looked at this and said, wait, this is how I live my life. <laughs> this, is, this is how I live my job. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so uh, as a paralegal, uh, so what I had everyone do is just look at the investigative abilities that I assigned them and their pre-generated characters and determine from that what their job had to be. Uh, and so we have some obvious uh, ones here for a paralegal, uh, law. Mm -hmm. uh, and, which is a knowledge of the law. Streetwise, which is an interpersonal ability that allows you to interact uh, with the uh, this shady side of life. Uh, psychology, pretty self-explanatory. Negotiation, that's when you get information out of people by offering them something. And then that most useful of gumshoe abilities, bullshit detector. Uh, and, uh, and Ruth, can you explain as a seasoned gumshoe game designer what bullshit detector does? So bullshit detector is a way in which I can tell if, say, someone comes into our law office and we're deposing them and getting their side of the whole thing, and I start to smell that maybe something's off. Now, I might not be able to get the real truth, but I can say, hmm, I want to use bullshit detector here because I have bullshit detector. Robin, how, how close to the truth is what they're telling me? And Robin will let me know if, you know, I have, like, if, if they're, say, hmm, Fudging around the edge is definitely straight up lying, that kind of thing. Um, now, I know that doesn't mean I get the answer, but it means that I can say, all right, let's try this again. So somebody here has got intimidation. Yeah, so it's not mind reading. It doesn't tell you what is going on, but it does give you a sense of when people are, are uh, fudging the truth. Now, some rare characters may be able to fool bullshit detector because if you're conscienceless, like a psychopath, uh, you don't feel guilt and you don't have tells. Uh, or if you're a weird alien robot, how do you know where a weird alien robot is lying? Uh, you don't. Uh, so next we come to uh, Saraf, Sharon's character. And uh, uh, you can see that he has bureaucracy, computers, forensic anthropology, which is uh, the coroner skill, basically, uh, medicine and science. Uh, those things all go together. And, uh, and Sharon, this le led you to uh, play a character who's far different than your uh, ordinary life, correct? Yes, because in my ordinary life, I'm an artist. Um, yeah, so I decided that my, my character is, um, well, so his, I didn't decide, but his drive is um, not only that there is a rational explanation for everything, but he must seek this rational explanation for everything, which is why when weird stuff may happen, he'll be like, wait, we need to figure out what's going on. And that he, he you know, he, he has a doctorate. He's very into like research and figuring things out. Uh, so that's, that, that drives him in life, uh, his like profession and things in addition to the, this mystery. So I think that's um, really cool. And he's gonna be very snooty about his fancy university and having multiple degrees and multiple subjects. Right. Um, and from being at a fancy university, uh, university uh, he uh, has bureaucracy, which of course is the number one ability you need to succeed at any university. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this enables him to get information of an official nature from official people, uh, and then uh, computers, forensic anthropology, medicine, and science. Uh, next, we move to uh, James Pemberton, as played by Wade. And uh, uh, Wade, uh, tell us about your drive. Uh, so uh, I am uh, I am also feeling a bit attacked here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I recently took a personality test at work, and it identified me as a helping supporter. And so uh, James's drive is, hey, I pull my weight around here, which could either be a confident declaration of, hey, I pull my weight around here, or defensive, because uh, maybe he's suspected of not pulling his weight around here. But uh, so he, uh, he has a strong commitment 
to doing his part and showing up for other people, but also uh, that's something that he feels he kind of has to prove to himself and others. Uh, so his abilities are uh, trivia, which is uh, basically any factoid that anybody uh, uh, would draw on uh, from any other uh, ability that uh, isn't listed uh, in the game, and also just general pop culture knowledge and so forth and assorted info. Um, but uh, to go through the other abilities, uh, Wade, and tell us how they helped you arrive at uh, your character's occupation. Well, I uh, so when I realized that I was probably going to show up uh, for this recording um, with just kind of something I could find at Target, um, I was like, okay, so this is actually going to be my character. He's the kind who who shows up but has maybe not done all of the required work beforehand. And so when I saw that I had the investigative ability of electronic surveillance, that made me think, it's like, huh, what, what kind of guy is like that but is also good at electronic surveillance? So I decided that he works at, a, uh, he works at uh, an electronics, a consumer electronics shop and maybe in customer service. So he actually like knows quite a lot about mobile technology and, uh, and gadgets and gizmos. Um, but he's not somebody who really has the the focus and organization to uh, be to, to be as good as he could be at other things. Um, likewise, um, the flattery, intuition, reassurance, and trivia kind of reinforce that you know he's the kind of guy you want to have around. He's the kind of guy you want talking to an angry customer. He's very reassuring. He's very charming. Um, but uh, but yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's a little bit of a galoot, kind of a Ralph Bellamy. Um, and uh, you have flattery, the ability to get information from people by uh, complimenting them, reassurance, uh, you get information out of people by assuring them that the consequence of that will not be bad. And you also have intuition, which is an ability to sort of sense on a, uh, a greater than rational level uh, something that's going on and put pieces together. And then uh, finally, we come to uh, Kat's character, Lucy, uh, and tell us about your drive. Right, um, so Lucy's drive is can't resist a puzzle. Um, and that's kind of, she has this, um, a lot of the work that she does is in what's called uh, forensic accounting. So it, it's kind of taking, uh, taking a present day financial situation and digging through it to work out how exactly it came to be like that, um, how the, the financial statements came to be in the way that they are. Um, and that's just kind of her thing, is that she gets very, she's very excitable, like I said earlier, and, and she just loves a mystery. She loves kind of the, you know, the thrill and the drama of mysteries and of puzzles and of anything where there's a question about what's going to happen or what has happened. So that's really, that's really kind of her bag, and and she's it's gotten her into it hasn't gotten her into any legal trouble, um, but it's certainly kind of gotten her into trouble with, for example, like people in the past. She's ended up falling in with bad people because she's tried to work out what it is has made them the way they are and that kind of thing. So it's a broad application to most areas of her life. Uh, and so we see obviously she's an accountant, so she has accounting. Uh, she has art history. Uh, which is a very specific field of knowledge which matters in the world of the Yellow King because it's very often about art and artists in some way. Uh, research, that's just the general uh, ability to gain information, for example, on the internet or in the library. Uh, now, there are a couple of uh, unexpected uh, ones, or one that requires an explanation and one that's uh, unexpected. So uh, why does Lucy have a deep knowledge of occultism, Kat? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the reason um, ties into why she's dressed as a flapper, which is that as a very young child, she read a book about um, uh, Egyptology and about the discovering of um, Tutankhamun and his tomb and all of that. And she was just, to her, the occult is the ultimate mystery, right? It's the thing that people know the least about. It's the, it's the, it is the puzzle of all puzzles. So she's very into kind of spiritualism she's very into that kind of 1920s -y kind of theosophical kind of vibe you know she's really in, interested in you know she's a big fan of Aleister Crowley and she just really takes a lot of kind of 
she's done a lot of work and a lot of research into that era, and it's an era that really appeals to her, which is why she's dressed as a flapper. Um, but it also kind of, again, it's like the art and the writing of that period is particularly what she's interested in, and that that love of the occult has has meant that she's broadened her um, she's broadened her research across a number of different areas from the the original kind of nineteen twenties focus. Uh and uh, also your interpersonal ability is called people person. Uh, and this is, doesn't just mean that you are friendly and outgoing, but rather that you just know a lot of people and you know a lot of people who know a lot of people and you have a good memory for uh, mm -hmm. people when you run into them. So you're the sort of person who, when you head into a coffee shop, you recognize three of the people there and you chat with them about how they're doing and you remember them and, and how they all fit together. And so this is sort of the ability to to just randomly bump into people who uh, can be helpful to you or to establish an immediate connection to, to someone. Uh, and that takes us through the character sheet. So now uh, we cut back to uh, our actual scene where the vehicle is uh, headed toward the uh, Yvain Observatory. And uh, the question I want to uh, ask uh, is, uh, are you driving or did you hire a car? And before you answer, I'm going to ask you another question, which is, I'm sure as uh, as players, this is something that none of us know anything about, but I'm, I know that horror movie characters are sometimes risk takers, and risk takers, when they head to a big party, sometimes partake of mind-altering substances. So uh, with a show of hands, uh, how many people are, uh, have uh, something with them that they're about to partake of as they head to the party? Okay. <laughs> so, is, oh, no. Okay. So everybody who uh, has uh, decided to uh, uh, partake will, uh, in a moment, uh, will determine using the rules uh, what, what effect, if any, that has on you going forward. Uh, but the first thing I want to find out is, uh, is, uh, uh, is it, uh, do we have a designated driver or is everybody uh, having fun? I think I might, I, as the, the fancy university person, might have uh, hired a car for us. Okay. Uh, so, uh, at this point, uh, everyone uh, makes a uh, health test, uh, so uh, look at your health pools, uh, determine uh, how many points uh, that you uh, want to uh, spend on uh, uh, your health roll, and we'll determine just how much uh, whatever it is that you're taking is uh, going to uh, affect you. So, uh, let's start uh, with, uh, with Kat. Uh, how many health points are you uh, going to spend? Wait, um, one, so, one moment, Robin. I, I noticed that you aren't telling us what the difficulty is that we have to beat. Uh, that's right. Uh, you never know what the difficulty is going to be. Uh, you uh, can kind of guess that it's mostly going to be four, unless the GM describes it as being especially difficult. So as seasoned gumshoe players, uh, you might all stroke your chins and think, well, this is just the beginning of the adventure, and it's just you know, me taking some stuff. So it's probably probably not anything more than a four, but you don't know for sure. You don't know what, what plans the GM has, has up uh, their sleeve. So uh, you're, uh, you have some certainty, but you're not absolutely certain what the difficulty is going to be. Okay, so I'm going to spend two points from my health pool. Okay. And then I roll in a license. You roll a d6. I got a one. Oh. Okay. Uh, so uh, that means that uh, you uh, not only, uh, so that was two, that's a three. Uh, and so uh, you are uh, uh, down by a, a one from the amount you needed. And so you now get a, uh, an injury card that reflects uh, your current uh, state. And so if we uh, go to the whiteboard, I'm just going to conjure up. Just a sec. And are you going to tell me what an injury card is, Robin? Uh, so an injury card is a card that you get that reflects your uh, physical state. And uh, if you get three of these, uh, you are... Uh, out of the game, and uh, sorry, just a second. 
Do you want to tell us, Lucy, how you acquired these substances? So I think that the her fascination with the occult um, leads her into a lot of um, occult bookstores and um, and that has kind of meant that as combined with a people person, she knows a lot of people. And so she tends to um, get, you know, invited to parties and things like that. But also she's offered things a lot. You know, she, she's, she's very kind of close to a lot of pagan people. And, and there's a lot of kind of mind-altering substances that they take, which are all, you know, very kind of natural and healthy. <laughs> They're just conducive getting into a greater, again, just to solve the mystery, right? You can't I love solve that. the mystery in your, your normal state of consciousness, but, like, once you <laughs> elevate yourself, then then you become tied into what's really out there. I love that you have, like, new age drugs. I love that. <laughs> you have, like, yeah. fancy thinking, new age herbal drugs. Absolutely, yeah. I'm thinking, like, one of those, um, I don't know if you call them head shops in the U.S. What's... Do you know what I mean when I say a headshot? No. Me, we did, yes. Okay. I'm a video game player, swear, so a headshot so. has a very specific <laughs> meaning for me. Um, a head, like a head, shop. a head shop, like a store. Oh, okay, cool. It, it, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a 60s, 70s uh, term uh, for right. a store. Okay. We sell uh, drug paraphernalia um, and. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and because of what you uh, picked up uh, at, at the head shop. Uh, you are high, so we see your injury card there. Uh, you uh, take a penalty of one to focus tests. Uh, that is a, one of the sub, one of the three types of uh, a general ability. Uh, so you will uh, take a penalty on some uh, general abilities going forward. Uh, you discard uh, this when you take a shock card. Uh, and so uh, this may motivate you to uh, move into uh, bad situations that might uh, <laughs> give you a shock card. But maybe the shock card is worse. You never know. Uh, so if you get three injury cards, that means uh, the final injury card uh, represents a uh, physical injury that prevents you from going forward into the story and uh, perhaps even kills you. Um, so uh, next, uh, uh, Misha, uh, uh, let us know about your uh, uh, how many points you're spending on your uh, health roll. Uh, I, I'll go with one. OK. Uh, She's just got booze. It's it's like it's a decent bourbon, but it's just booze. <laughs> uh, so uh, I rolled a six, so that would be a seven total. Okay, so you're perfectly fine. You can totally h handle that. You're not really impaired at all. It's a good bourbon. It's a good bourbon. It's a good bourbon. quality bourbon. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get a hammer on a good bourbon. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, sunshine. Well, I am going to choose to live dangerously, and I will be spending zero points. So okay. let's find out how that goes. Oh, I rolled a five. Uh, oh, I so just brought something that I got at a goth show like last week, and it was fine then, and I'm sure it'll be <laughs> fine tonight. Hope. Uh, yeah. So you're you're doing just great, and uh, the uh, and next week come to uh, to sorrow. So um, if Lucy has an all-natural drug habit, I'm the complete opposite, right? So I work in an interdisciplinary anthropological lab, and one of my colleagues is an anthropological chem is a chemical anthropologist, sorry, and he makes experimental drugs and on the DL sells it to the undergrads. Um, and we don't rat him out if he gives us some when the time comes. So I'm spending one point because, you know, I sometimes go to the gym. I'm a gay man. Um, and I roll my die. Ooh, that was very loud. I rolled a six plus a one. Okay, so uh, uh, I guess uh, in keeping with uh, uh, going to the gym or being a gay man or both, your resistance is, is pretty good, so you're fine. You're, you're not <laughs> he's he's a very good chemist. He makes really yeah. high-quality stuff. Exactly. You, yeah, you, you've had some of that stuff before. And finally... That's why uh, you don't rat him out. <laughs> yeah. And finally, we come to James. Hmm. Uh, uh, tonight, uh, James is having a, uh, a uh, cannabis edible. It is a delicious pineapple gummy that uh, he got at his local uh, cannabis shop. Um, perhaps he has a, a medical marijuana card, which, uh, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned that, uh, we are emerging from a pandemic. So I imagine if you go to a doctor and say, Hey, I'm anxious all the time, it's pretty easy to get, uh, get a card for that. 
so yeah, I'm going to spend one point for a total of five. Five. Uh, so again, uh, you you folks are all mostly seasoned party goers. So uh, Lucy seems pretty sloppy right out of the gate, uh, but the rest of you uh, seem to be doing fine. And so the camera at this point sort of gives a close up uh, on uh, Lucy and uh, we. Uh, kind of goes out of focus a little bit. And uh, at this point, uh, Lucy, you see a, a vehicle uh, heading toward you, uh, toward the, the hired car at uh, high speed. And uh, you, it's, uh, it's, a, it's weird, it's sort of glowing yellow and it's like an old fashioned uh, uh, car. And, and uh, uh, given your interest in the 20s, uh, this is not, uh, uh, normally your area of expertise, uh, cars in general, but you know 20s cars, and you know that there's a 1924 glowing yellow Bugatti, uh, a, a high-powered expensive sports car of the period, barreling head-on uh, toward uh, the vehicle, and uh, what you do. It's a nice car. Check it out. It's 1920s. It's like it's a sign. And do I see so, it's uh, if she's like pawing at me, telling me about this car, do I see the car? Uh, you do not see a car. It's coming out of very fast. <laughs> I turned to Angela. No, no. Oh, I don't know what's in her thing. Do I see uh, it? Uh, no. Uh, 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 and at this point, uh, just at the last minute, uh, Lucy, you realize that that car is actually going to uh, collide with your vehicle and that and that. You know, you're high, but you're not so high that you want a car to smash into you. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, um, I'm going to, she's going to shout to the driver and go, okay, hey, dude, you, you've got to turn. You've got to turn. Turn, 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 left, right, turn, turn, so turn. So he, he uh, swerves off to the side, goes onto the shoulder, and you look back behind you and you see the car rocket past you and hit a tree. And then all of a sudden, uh, not only is the car gone, but so is the tree. And the driver turns and says, what, what was it? Was there, was there like a rabbit or something? It, it, Lucy, sweetie, are you was, okay? It, um, did you not see that car in the tree? Lucy, what have you been taking? You really need me, you really need to, me to hook you up with some quality stuff. None of that, like, who knows what's in the herbal things you have. Mm. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's healthy and stuff but yeah i mean um yeah i, yeah. I think we're the only car on the road right now no but there's there was a, there's a no tree <laughs> everybody else is going to the planetarium too there's nobody coming the other way um and there was the guy that passed us like half an hour ago no this no it was no mm. honey honey keep okay. eating snacks keep it in your snacks i mean it was you know just, okay. just so That's at this point, uh, <laughs> Lucy is going to make a composure test. How many points uh, would you like to spend on composure? Um, I think I'm going to spend zero points. Ooh. Okay. And I live so, dangerously, um, despite right. the fact that my dice is clearly rolling terribly. I got a four. Okay. Uh, so that's a. This was weird, but it's not. You're not going to let that shake you. That, I, I've seen weirder things that then subsequently disappeared that um, nobody else saw. You know. uh, so, so the, the, the driver uh, sort of shakes his head. He's, uh, uh, as a driver of people to parties in this city, he's, uh, he's seen some uh, people have some weird reactions in his car. He's not going to let this uh, perturb him because he's got to get back and pick some more people up. So he drops make you off. note to increase his tip. Yeah. Uh, so he's very happy with the, the tip, and uh, he's uh, and at this point uh, you're getting out of the vehicle and you're turning around. Uh, so you've got uh, the invites to Mr. Wild's Wild Halloween at the Yvain Observatory, uh, and uh, you've paid your uh, you've got your tickets and you've got your little uh, uh, card that has the information about the party on it, the flyer sort of thing, and you turn it and it says "See other side for password," and so you uh, uh, turn that over and you see. Uh, that it uh, reads as follows. It says, when challenged at the door, reply, indeed. And then when challenged a second time, reply, uh, 
I wear no mask. I look around at everybody like, do you think they're going to have a problem with this? Or, I mean, I don't want to overthink it, but, you know, I am like paralegal brain, right? I think that's the point. Like, you're wearing the mask, but, like, metaphorically, you're not wearing the mask. I I like it. Like, the whole point of it. All right. I wear no mask. like, the mask from who we are, who we present to the world. And be, like, us. Like, our regular face is the mask. We could, like, okay. Be your inner self. I know it's been more than a decade since we were all in school together, but maybe we should, like, think back to when we were in school, like, what were we like then? We're not the same people now, but was that the true self of us? (laughs) We're all high, aren't we? Slightly. (laughs) Lucy's very high, but all of us are slightly high. You're you're all high, just in... Except for Cat in a way that the game system doesn't matter. Yeah, Cat is just particularly high. Um, <laughs> and so uh, you head on up the steps into this area where the spotlights are honored and they're, they're, that's clearly at the entrance. Uh, you see a couple who are, uh, who've been angrily turned away for violating the event's uh, cultural sensitivity costume policies. And you uh, head on in uh, to, uh, to, to sort of foyer area. And indeed, they've set up a kind of a a door in front of the thing with a, a, that sort of slider where the uh, they slide the the peephole and the eye like a speakeasy kind like of a thing. speakeasy kind of thing, mm-hmm. and uh, the, you hear a voice say, "You sir, should unmask." And and I I turn to everyone and I like nod excitedly and I'm like indeed, but like really loudly and really like dramatically, uh, and. Uh, Indeed, it's time. We have all laid aside disguise, but you. And then I nudge one of the others, like, go, go, go. I wear no mask. <laughs> we all get really excited. <laughs> and the doors fling open, and uh, now you uh, head on in to the, uh, uh, the main area of the foyer. And uh, Lucy, a a student of architecture, as you were uh, headed in, you noticed that this this building is a really strange sort of mix of things. You can tell the main original observatory is uh, from the 1920s and is uh, quite attractive in that sort of neo-Edwardian style. Uh, And, uh, but there's also a big concrete style, uh, 70s modernist brutalist kind of wing. And that's the one that actually has the planetarium where they would have had the light shows back in the day. Uh, and so it's quite a large area. And so you're all swept into uh, this uh, uh, observatory area where all of the public areas are, are hopping with people and uh, there's big uh, music. Uh, and so for the rest of this, anytime you're inside the main area where the party is going on, let's just as- assume that there's big loud music playing and everybody has to be shout to be heard. We're not going to a play music or be shout at each other because both of those things would be very annoying to our Zoom audience, or sorry, our Twitch audience. Uh, but uh, just keep that in mind as as uh, part of the scene. And so uh, at this point, uh, I'd just like a, a sort of a quick bit of internal monologue from everybody. Uh, what uh, do people want to have happen at the party for them? What do you, you're not? Nobody heads to a party consciously thinking, "What are my party goals?" But just uh, uh, tell me kind of what uh, you're uh, open to and what you hope happen uh, over the course of the party. And let's start with, uh, uh, with Angela. Uh, it was probably like just looking to chill out, like uh, it's something low key, no stress, just cut loose, enjoy herself for an evening. Okay, and uh, then we go to uh, James. What are you hoping is, is going to happen? Look, uh, it's it's my job to talk to people all day, so uh, I really hope that there's good music because I want to dance, uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, maybe hook up. And uh, Sunshine. Well, 
I'm definitely hoping that the music is good. And by good, I mean a very specific genres of metal. And then I'm thinking, one, I want to meet some really interesting people. I've heard good things about this crowd. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe tonight I meet somebody interesting and, you know, there could be some potential for, I don't want to say like a hookup necessarily, but adventures in the future. And I'm sort of thinking, I wonder if they still do those light shows. And I wonder if Lucy will share something of what she's got and we could, you know, go to the light shows. Uh, and uh, Lucy, what is she uh, in the back of her mind hoping will happen? Um, so I think that Lucy is definitely looking for like, she's looking to meet interesting people at the party so she wants to have like big conversations with people you know about life the universe and everything um but also she's like again not so much looking for a hookup she's more in the kind of um like you know having a massive spiritual connection with somebody and maybe like getting together in a kind of a bodily kind of way as well and uh, Saurav, what, uh, what's his idea of a, a good time at an event like this? Yeah, so uh, Saurav's boyfriend is a performative chef. So on Friday nights, he's always working. So Friday nights is free Fridays where uh, Saurav spends the night with someone else, perhaps. And Angela introduced him in their hangout once to this, like, tall, dark, and handsome, mysterious person. And one way Angela convinced Saurav to come to this party was like, but well, he didn't need much convincing, but you know, he was, she was like, oh, this, the person I introduced you to is going to be there. And I'm like, oh, how exciting. So I'm actually hoping to run into him, like specifically. Sebastian. <laughs> Seb yeah, to run into Sebastian, this like mysterious person from Hungary. Um, who is like cool and sexy and and is not working all night doing hibachi and uh so uh since the members of the group sort of have uh, divergent uh plans and uh, a lot of them seem to be of meeting people other than their friends uh the as often happens at a big event you're all kind of swept off uh in different directions and find yourselves uh, kind of shortly in uh, different places and kind of uh, mostly lose uh, track of each other uh, and so uh, at this point, uh, uh, the, the place is quite big, and there's a couple of different dance floors, uh, and there's uh, surprisingly well soundproofed uh, so that there's not a lot of uh, leakage between the two uh, dance floors. And so there's a, uh, uh, a metal floor and an, an EDM floor, and uh, presumably uh, it is... Uh, uh, Sunshine, who uh, heads toward the uh, the metal floor, uh, but uh, uh, and and while you're there, uh, or as you're sort of headed in the door, uh, someone comes up to you and uh, uh, and they're dressed uh, as a clown, and they have a, a strange uh, sort of symbol uh, tattooed uh, on uh, on their forearm, and there's sort of a dealy bobber uh, from from the forehead and this pale. Uh, uh, pallid uh, makeup and there's something very sort of sad and melancholy about uh, about the outfit and you find this person uh, kind of captures your attention and is, is quite riveting and uh, he says is that a ghoul mask yeah yeah so that's that's a bold choice i kind of like it yeah i'm uh, i'm a dream clown robin Oh, so what's a dream clown? Is that like... Well, I've been going around the party trying to talk to people because when I made this costume, I was sure that there was a show for kids when we were all kids called The Dream Clown. Uh, and I remember watching it. And I don't know, I think everybody's here is trying to gaslight me because I keep saying, I'm the dream clown. And I expect them to go, yeah, yeah, it's the dream clown. Yeah, yeah, I remember watching that. That's an awesome costume, man. He was way better than Mr. Rogers. And... No, I, you know, that's interesting. But I, I'm thinking about it. And, you know, I mean, we all had Reading Rainbow, right? But I don't know. Maybe I just wasn't up on that kind of thing. I'm sorry. That's, that's a real bummer. But it's a great look. It's like... 
kind of spooky. You said this was a kid's show? Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, the dream clown, when you were scared, he would enter your dreams at night and he would like uh, uh, fight off uh, the, the enemies that attacked you and uh, he would protect you. And he would, the dream clown is always there for you, man. Except everybody thinks I'm, I don't know. Do you think I dreamt the dream clown? Oh, you know, I, I did have some recurring dreams when I was a kid, like that there was a secret world behind my dresser. And I could have sworn that was real. And I think my sister had the same dream. But, you know, apparently there wasn't a secret world behind my dresser. So, yeah. Oh, I mean, so who was in the secret world behind your dresser? Oh, it was just like a bunch of stairs that kind of went down under the house and they were missing steps. And so sometimes you might fall through but sometimes it would be like a big flashy bright room and sometimes it would be dark and cobwebby. You just never knew what you're going to get. Yeah. Oh, really that's, creepy. that's, that's crazy. Uh, and, uh, and then a, a new tune comes on and he goes, Oh, I've got to dance to this. Come on. And he heads on uh, to the, yeah. onto the dance floor. Um, and so uh, at, at this point, Angela has found her way into the chill lounge where she can uh, hang out, relax, uh, feel that everything is uh, uh uh, down tempo uh, and again the soundproofing is surprisingly good uh, there's sort of this yellow draping of, of brocade fabrics on the wall and this sort of down tempo music and uh, you find yourself talking uh, there's this group of, of uh, uh, dudes who've all kind of obviously come together they're wearing uh, devil costumes except weirdly uh, instead of the and it's like the standard cartoon red devil Except in this instance, it is a uh, they're they're yellow instead of red, uh, and they uh, uh, notice that you're wearing the crown. They notice that you're wearing the uh, Empress of Evil thing, and they say, uh, "That's that's the best costume. What what is your costume? What are you dressed up as?" I'm the Empress of Evil. Who are you? We are the servants of evil. It's like fate. It is like fate. Can we worship and obey you? I, I never say no to that. <laughs> and so they all uh, bow down to you. And as you notice that, uh, that they're doing that, there's something, a couple things about them. First of all, they're all five foot two. Um, and uh, you kind of think that they, and they all kind of look similar to each other. They have similar features, but they can't possibly all be related because uh, they're, uh, some of them are clearly from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. And so even though they can't possibly be brothers, they all seem somehow to have this commonality uh, and, uh, and they seem really into worshiping and bowing down to you. And they say, hey, uh, would you be the honorary uh, empress of our club, the Larry Club? Are you all named Larry? Uh, most of us are named Larry. And uh, those of us who are not named Larry have become honorary Larrys. And, and besides sharing a name, what does the Larry Club do? Uh, what, uh, we're all the same height. We're mostly named Larry and we're here to party. Then I will gladly be the queen of the Larry Club. We bow down to you, our queen. Uh, we uh, cut now to Lucy, uh, and you're sort of just heading, wandering uh, between uh, uh, different party rooms. And you notice as part of the, uh, the art up on the wall, and this is not part of the, it's clearly part of the standard decoration of the observatory and rather, rather than uh, a, a, uh, piece of like it's not part of the party decorations it's standard and you notice a painting and it really captures your eye because uh, you can tell with your knowledge of art history uh, that uh, it was painted uh, in the 1920s and uh, it's in that style but it's a portrait of you in your current costume and hairstyle uh, and underneath it, there's a little name plaque that would be like the plaque of the, uh, not the painter, but the subject of the painting. And it says, 
Colette Nicholas. Colette Nicholas. Colette Nicholas. Does the name mean anything to Lucy? Uh, you're not familiar with that name, uh, but you're, uh, as you look more at the uh, painting, you realize that it has to be uh, by the uh, American painter Leslie Gibson, uh, who uh, was uh, active uh, during uh, the uh, early part of the century, the teens and the 20s. Uh, you know that he was uh, uh, a uh, uh, popular portrait painter of the period and uh, was uh, known for uh, uh, painting pictures of the, uh, the well-to-do social set. Hmm. That is odd. I'm going to turn. Is there, is there anyone kind of near me, like any random person or whatever? Uh, yes, there is a, uh, a random uh, person, uh, and uh, uh, she is dressed as a, as a mermaid. Hey, mermaid. I have uh, a, hey, flapper. I have a weird question, right, because I'm kind of like... I'm just, I'm not entirely, can you just like look at this picture, right? And then look at so me. So this is the picture that you based your costume on? That's awesome. Uh, I, um, yeah. Do, do, you, do you think I look like her? You've pulled it off, you pulled it off totally. That's like, how did you, uh, do you? know this place? Did you come here? Did you see the painting and then base your, you must have, right? You must yeah. have seen that you're like the spitting image of this person and then pick the costume to fit. That's, that's so thematic. Do you work here? No. Cool. That's cool. awesome. That's, a, that's great. Cool. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's not, so you can See the resemblance. Resemblance? That's like, I could swear that's like a picture of, of you, except it's done in old timey style. That's, this isn't like a, it, is that a picture of you? No, but, um, okay, leave it with me. Uh, well, uh, cool costume, uh, have a good time. And yeah, mermaid, you too, mermaid. And the mermaid uh, shuffles off. It's hard to walk in a mermaid costume. Uh, and uh, uh, at this point, uh, uh, so, so which of the dance floors uh, is James headed for? Is it the, the metal or the EDM floor? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, part of me uh, wants to, wants to uh, go where my friend Sunshine is, but uh, really I don't, like, I can't really dance to metal as well as EDM, and and so uh, yeah, that that sounds really more like my scene. Um, and so you're <clears throat> headed there, and uh, you are uh, intercepted by a couple of uh, uh, people wearing uh, sort of event planner outfits. A couple of uh, uh, young twenty-somethings, uh, a handsome dude and an attractive woman, and they look at you and go, "You." half-ask your costume. I, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 it, it, Halloween just really kind of crept up on me, and so... You uh, had this on are set. the one we've been waiting for. What, like, am I in trouble? No, you're the one. The one who half-asked his costume? The one whose costume... You're just wearing your provisional costume. What, what's your name? Uh, James. James. Uh, we knew that you'd be coming. And we have your real costume for you. If you just want to step into this uh, little office here, you can change into it. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, lead on. And so they uh, lead you on into this uh, office area, and they uh, give you a... Uh, uh, these long, tattered, scalloped, yellow robes. And uh, they're uh, both sort of, uh, uh, sort of like, a, makes you think of a lich, 
if you're familiar with that, uh, if, if you have known enough nerd culture to think of something that is both uh, exciting and uh, fancy, yet also sort of rotted and decayed. Oh, and yeah. And they put a, put a crown on your head, and then they fit you uh, with a skull-like mask. Uh, and uh, uh, they say, uh, uh, here you go. Uh, uh, here's, your, uh, here's your true face. And they uh, put the mask uh, on your face, and it, and it fits very strangely, very, very sort of tightly, and it sort of almost sort of hugs itself to your features. It doesn't even need uh, to have an elastic band around the back, so uh, so perfectly formed it is, or possibly it has sort of some sort of sort of silicon or polymer in it. I don't know how they're doing it. Maybe there's spirit gum on it. You're not sure, but yeah, this yeah. mask is very very tight to your uh, face. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, as soon as it goes on, uh, you're, you think that maybe something has gone wrong. And uh, at that point, you uh, make a composure test. OK. Hmm. Uh, I am going to spend a point of composure. OK. Uh, make your uh, roll. <laughs> um, for a total of two. For a total of two. Uh, so, hey, uh, you, you guys, uh, okay, uh, and, uh, you turn around and, and you're asking, and somehow through the, through the eye slits, uh, the people who gave you the costume are gone. And you're uh, feeling somewhat discombobulated. And you have acquired, uh, as we can see, uh, your, the shock card, bit of a sticky wicket. Uh, you're minus one to focus tests. Uh, and uh, the way you get rid of this is when you escape your current predicament, discard and roll a die. And uh, on an odd result, you would then gain a different shock card, the shock card unnerved. Uh, so I, I, I kind of wildly look around the office. They're, they're, they're nowhere? Yeah, uh, they're gone. Uh, wow. Um, I, I, kind of, I kind of check in with myself about the extent to which I am now high. I mean, is this... Um, you feel... Uh, you're, you're feeling that sort of adrenaline surge that it may have occurred to you, depending on how much of a risk taker you are, on several occasions where you were very, very intoxicated or high and did something dangerous, and then all of a sudden you realize you're in danger, and then you were full of cortisol and, and freaked out. So uh, yeah, huh. And I'm alone in, in an office. Uh, weird. Uh, I, 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 I take off the mask. Uh, no, you don't. What it's it's like stuck? It's stuck. It won't come off. What the hell? <sighs> it's, I kind of look at the. the am, I, am I wearing the robes also? Yes. Were they were they put upon me? I yes. mean, so is is it like a really high quality, elaborate kind of costume? Oh yeah, it's it's uh, looks pretty fancy. It's like movie quality costuming. I mean, okay, so on the one hand, this is the first time I've ever been rewarded for half-assing something, but um, I don't... <laughs> like your average Joe. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, guess, I guess I'll go out and uh, I'll, maybe I can find those guys later and, and just ask them how to get this mask off. This is super weird. So I, uh, I leave the office. Okay. They, didn't me, they didn't even tell me what I was supposed to be. I mean, this looks like a thing. And so uh, at this point, uh, 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 Sorov has uh, uh, indeed uh, found uh, Sebastian Kodai, uh, the Hungarian hunk. And uh, uh, Sebastian is uh, uh, dressed as a, as a robot. And he uh, sort of points at, uh, at uh, Sorov as he approaches. You mad scientist, you weird scientist, you perfect, you perfect for this. My uh, robot arm malfunction. And, and I'm he, like, oh, I would love to take a look and, and fix your anatomy. 
and I'm high, uh, right? So that makes me forward. <laughs> well, he seems pretty receptive because he he uh, holds out his arm to you, and he's got this sort of uh, big sort of metal applique uh, thing uh, that he's put on to be his robot cyborg arm. Uh, but you can see that the uh, bolts and stuff have kind of come loose, and he actually is having a, a problem. Oh, like his, his costume is actually coming apart, his, kind of. Yes, his costume is actually uh, coming apart, but he's also sort of dancing around uh, uh, very Hungarian and hunkily, and uh, <laughs> sort of making this a big sort of performance thing where you're supposed to come and you know interact with him as you uh, dance and fix his uh, costume. Yeah, yeah. I, I have, so my impression, um, I don't remember if Angela told me or not, but my impression is he's like a visiting mathematician from Hungary, right? Um, that's what's in my head about who he is. Um, yeah, all, all of the best looking Hungarians are visiting mathematicians. <laughs> we, we all know that. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I'm going to go and start dancing with him. Like, whoa. And then, yeah, I'm, if he gives me his arm, I'll make a show. Of, I'll, I'll actually try and put his costume back together. Otherwise, I'm just, I'm going to enjoy myself and dance with this guy. Um, and so uh, the final uh, shot before we uh, uh, take a brief break is uh, you're at one end of the uh, corridor, delightedly dancing and fixing his outfit with him, having a great time. On one end of the corridor coming toward you, looking sort of stunned and freaked out, is uh, uh, James uh, with his white uh, mask and crown and tattered yellow <laughs> robes. On the other side is Lucy, who's just seen a portrait of herself from 1924. She's looking weirded out looking for reassurance, and they're both sort of converging on you from different sides without your having uh, noticed uh, them. And uh, we're going to take a brief break and be right back with more Yellow King after this uh, brief wait screen. 